Thank you, Ed, and uh, Chairman Adams, it's great to see you, and thank you for coming to share your good company and your uh, illuminating thoughts on the humanities, which I hope you leave thinking you made an impact, but also that you s saw a school, a great research university that is deeply committed in every way to the humanities and puts it tops on the list for support and certainly my cheerleading. Um, this is indeed the 50th anniversary of the founding of NEH, and we are lucky to have Chairman Adams here, as his, his friends call him bro, uh, which um, I hope you don't mind. That no. I, I, when you spoke, he, he was at uh, the Association of American Universities a couple weeks ago, uh, and there were about 50 college presidents sitting around, and we were all in awe that the chairman of the National Endowment was there. And then he said, well, you know, my nickname is Bro, and we all felt very, very comfortable. So I don't, I never stand on ceremony. So uh, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, I also wanna just recognize the important role that the National Endowment has indeed played for Vanderbilt in, in so many ways. I think of uh, some of the faculty are in the room I know Stephen, uh, Steve Wernke, Associate Professor of Anthropology, he's working on a project right now on prototyping two new electronic resources for collecting and analyzing geospatial data related to the colonization of Peru. And as if um, we weren't already interdisciplinary and transinstitutional enough, that idea came from uh, his uh, fascinating and brilliant young colleague, my friend Dave Michelson an assistant professor of Christianity and history who is preserving Syriac culture, including historical data about key moments in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and uh, what an important role that David is playing. So that connection is, is quite incredible. Uh, Marshall Aiken, professor of history, his research on miscegenation in Brazil has appoint, uh, been supported by NEH. Uh, Shaul Kellner, associate professor of sociology and Jewish studies, um, studying the cultural dimensions of the Cold War, American movement of Soviet Jews. Cliff Anderson, um, director of scholarly communications in our library, hosting our Institute on the Digital Humanities and what wonderful work Cliff has done. We were here recently celebrating with scholars from around the world, led by our own amazing librarians and Jane Landers, who really is building a digital slave archive that um, you know, as, as, as I think of it, our universities are really creating knowledge, but we have special responsibilities as well to preserve knowledge because the preservation of that knowledge um, defines who we are as people. And of course, throwing a plug in for my deeply aggrieved brethren in Greece who are suffering did discover a new tomb today. Mm -hmm. And um, we should never take for granted that we know all about ourselves and our history. Um, let me talk a little bit about our, our distinguished guest, graduated from Colorado College, received a PhD in the history of consciousness from the University of California at Santa Cruz. And if I hadn't gone down the dirty path of law, I would have been a historian, so I, I am an admirer of that. Moved to Stanford University, he's been the president of Bucknell, the president of Colby College, and then in uh, an act of, uh, of real commitment to service for our country and the humanities, uh, accepted the president's invitation to be the 10th president of the National Endowments, and uh, he has served in that role after being appointed by the president in 2014. Um, I think that um, we talk a lot about the crisis in the humanities, and you know my view is that, at least at Vanderbilt, they are in full bloom, and they are making a tremendous impact. And I think we've got to get off the kind of crisis talk and be much, much more boastful and kind of um, uh, uh, go on the offensive of the importance of the humanities. But Lyndon Johnson, when he signed this legislation in 1965 to create the NEA and the NEH, he said, we in America have not always been kind to the artists and the scholars who are the creators and the keepers of our vision. Somehow the scientists always seem to get to the penthouse while the arts and humanities get the basement. Well, I have to say some of my scientists, Susan, would say sometimes they're in the basement too, <laughs> considering the state of the NIH budget. And the only people that make it to the penthouse up there, I think, is actually the animal care. <laughs> because of the ventilation is so good. Um, 
But um, these are absolutely uh, essential funding mechanisms. Um, the goals of the NEH, I think, sit side by side with the goals of a great university. Strengthen teaching, facilitate research, provide opportunities for lifelong learning, preserve and provide access to cultural and educational resources, and strengthen, strengthen, and build upon the institutional base of the humanities. I also want to draw attention that our Robert Penn Warren Center that Mona Frederick so uh, uh, brilliantly leads into a national center um, was the recipient of a challenge grant of $480,000 in 1989. And it is a jewel on the campus. So um, I'm very pleased and proud to welcome you, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chancellor for coming. Thanks to all of you for coming in the rain. I appreciate it very much. It's great uh, to see you all. I want to begin by thanking Mona um, and the Robert Penn Warren Center for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm especially honored to take part in this very distinguished uh, lecture series, and I'll do my best uh, to join the great humanities voices who have spoken from this place, at least metaphorically, uh, over the years. I want to echo uh, what the Chancellor said, uh, if it's, I hope it doesn't seem too boastful, if I again note the fact that the first, I think it was the first major gift that the Warren Center received um, to endow some of its activities, of course, was a challenge grant uh, from the NEH. I don't take personal credit for that, <laughs> of course, uh, but as we celebrate our 50th, which we're doing, I will say that um, as we take stock of our achievements, I'm honored to be able to observe the impressive results uh, here at Vanderbilt. This is a picture, by the way, of the president. You mentioned this moment of signing. This is kind of a close-up from a broader uh, field in the picture, but um, there he is. Uh, with lots of other peoples. We haven't crowdsourced this completely, so I can't tell you who everybody uh, is there, but there are a lot of important people in that picture who were very involved uh, in the creation of NEA and NEH. So let me begin as I started to think about this lecture uh, in earnest several weeks ago. I found myself thinking immediately and somewhat reflexively about the Vanderbilt alumnus for whom this center is named. I first encountered Robert Penn Warren's work at the Actors Theater in Louisville, Kentucky, in the winter of 1967. It's pretty painful to say that, actually, 1967. In a performance of All the King's Men, I was a very young second lieutenant in the US Army, stationed at nearby Fort Knox. And when I had the time and opportunity, I'd head for Louisville. You, you hear, I think, the correct pronunciation of that city. <laughs> I attended plays at the Actors Theater several times during my year at Fort Knox. And I also took a philosophy course, of all things, in aesthetics at the University of Louisville Night School. So what was I doing at the Actors Theater and at the university? It, I think, was in part a form of compensation. I'd left college very abruptly after a very unhappy and confusing first year. My decision to join the Army in June of 1966 was impulsive, uh, to say the least. And it didn't take long for me to wish that I was back in college. So I invented a sort of substitute universe for myself, almost as if the rest hadn't happened. But I now know that there was more to it than that. Being an executive officer in a basic training company at Fort Knox in 1967, as the Vietnam War and the draft escalated, was a searing experience, I have to say, for a young man who had grown up in a comfortable middle-class suburb of Detroit I encountered people from every imaginable ba background uh, at Fort Knox, and their lives in the Army were hard and unforgiving and unpromising. 
Many of the soldiers I came into contact with that year were on their way to Vietnam, as I was, only months after leaving Fort Knox. And I was desperately trying to put all of this together, to shape it into some kind of meaningful whole. And I knew, I think in a vague and inchoate way, that the things I saw and heard at the Actors Theater and at the university were relevant in some way to that process. I was in some ways a very young and unsophisticated version of Warren's character, Jack Burden, who struggles throughout the novel and the play to put the fragments of his experience into some kind of meaningful order. What I'd like to share with you this afternoon is a view of the purposes and powers of the humanities that's rooted in the proposition that in some form or another, the humanities almost always come back to the centrality of meaning in our experience and individual and collective lives. I hope it won't seem too acrobatic if I attempt, in addition to connect this proposition to the evolution of NEH over the last 50 years and to fundamental changes in the ways in which we understand the humanities and indeed culture itself. On February 26, 1965, about five or six months before this picture was taken, the President of the American Council of Learned Societies appeared before the House and Senate subcommittees charged with hearing testimony on the recently drafted National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act, which the President signed into law a few months later. A portion of Burkhardt's testimony reads as follows. Carthage was a culture that devoted its creative talents to war and trade, he said. It came close to defeating Rome. When, finally, the Romans wiped out Carthage, there was nothing left but a pile of rubble on the plains of what we now call Tunisia. But when the Huns sacked Rome, Virgil and Cicero, Terence, Ovid, Catullus and Horace, and a host of other poets and statesmen remained a living force and have lived with us to this day. So too, he concludes, any civilization will be a living force in the world of the future to the extent that it values and nurtures the creative forces of the arts and humanities. The legislation creating NEA and NEH was an important element, as I think you all know, of the incredible legislative agenda enacted by Congress and the Johnson administration in the mid-1960s. An agenda, by the way, that was launched at the very moment the country was entering one of the most tumultuous periods in its modern history, maybe in its entire history. But even as the idea of creating a federal agency dedicated to advancing the humanities was unprecedented and in some ways very progressive, uh, as I will share later, it was also deeply rooted in traditional cultural, cultural and intellectual norms, as Burkhart's words suggest. His references to the classics are telling, and so too is the apparent anxiety that for all its power and wealth, post-World War II American society still lacked the cultural solidity of older, more mature civilizations. We might still end up like Carthage, how will we look to the future and to future societies as they look back on us? Will there be anything worth thinking about? This is a view of culture and of the humanities that has distinct echoes of the high Victorian sensibilities of Matthew Arnold. In Arnold's rendering, culture is a collection of great works of mind and spirit that are bequeathed to the future and that the future will hopefully receive and contemplate with admiration and appreciation. In this framework, the humanities are essentially about the excavation and exploration of the great cultural tradition. The result of that exploration is the improvement of our own minds and sensibilities through exposure to great works of thought and artistic expression. This understanding of the humanities is also clearly on display in the report of the Commission on the Humanities published in 1964, which Burkhardt helped to write. The commission was formed through the efforts, as some of you know, of the American Council of Learned Societies, Phi Beta Kappa, and the Council in Graduate Schools in 1963. 
and its report led to the drafting of the legislation creating NEA and NEH. The preface to that report begins with the famous remark attributed to John Adams, quote, I must study politics and war that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, Adams continues, geography, natural history, and naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting and poetry and music and architecture. There is a very closely related reference to this same view of culture in one of the principal arguments the commission advanced for the creation of federal agencies devoted to cultural concerns as a revealing artifact of the times and of a certain understanding of culture, the passage is worth sharing. The commission report reads, a novel and serious challenge to Americans is posed by the remarkable increase in their leisure time. The 40 hour work week and the likelihood of a shorter one, the greater life expectancy and the earlier age of retirements have combined to make the blessing of leisure a source of personal and community concern. What shall I do with my spare time? All too quickly becomes the question, who am I and what shall I make of my life? When men and women find nothing within themselves but emptiness, they turn to trivial and narcotic amusements and the society of which they are part becomes socially delinquent and potentially unstable. The humanities are the immemorial answer to man's questioning and to his need for self-expression. They are uniquely equipped to fill, quote, the abyss of leisure, close quote. As I read this, I can't help but wonder what the report's authors would think about the ways in which Americans currently fill the abyss of leisure. And in light of what has happened in the United States economy and the culture of work over the past five decades, I am also struck by how surprising, indeed almost astonishing and unfathomable to us, is the notion that the world of material necessity and work would soon give way to a world of universal leisure. But we have to remember that this was in the air in 1965 in both conservative and progressive circles of social thought. As I was reading this for the first time, oh, about a year ago when I got to NEH, I thought immediately, and some of you would remember this too, of the famous uh, work of Herbert Marcuse, One Dimensional Man, and the whole premise of that text is basically about the, the transcendence of this realm of material necessity into a realm of freedom. This was a very sort of common way of thinking about things in the Frankfurt School generally. It was just out there uh, in, in the world in 1965. But what's more interesting to me in this passage is the fundamental assumption that culture and its understanding and appreciation lie outside the everyday worlds of work and politics and commerce. Recalling Aristotle's view that the life of the mind succeeds the household and political realms, while in every sense depending on them, culture is here conceived as the creature of leisure, becoming possible only once the realm of material necessity and all that it entails is left behind. In light of this traditional understanding of culture and of the humanities, it's not terribly surprising, I think, that the earliest priorities of the NEH were focused on research and quite traditional research and on the elite higher education in institutions, public and private, where fundamental humanities research was most typically conducted. There were other pressures leading in this same direction, including considerable envy of the National Science Foundation, founded a decade or so before. And there were certainly other impulses operating in the broad humanities community, <clears throat> which I'll come back to shortly. But the classical paradigm was certainly a force in the early period of NEH's work, and it was associated with a number of other important assumptions and positions regarding higher education and the cultural realities of the United States, including a highly professionalized, principally academic, and increasingly specialized view of the humanities, distance from the public and public concerns, a strongly hierarchical view of higher education, and the pervasive and fundamental belief in the distinction between high culture and mass culture, 
between the highbrow and the lowbrow. The irony of this moment, of course, is that the traditional humanities paradigm, or this classical paradigm I'm trying to describe, was about to crash into the wall of history. In 1965, the civil rights movement was well underway, of course, to be followed shortly by the swelling of the anti-war movement, the counterculture, and the early stirrings of the women's movement. I don't want to draw an overly simple picture of the relationship between social movements and ideas of culture, but it's very clear that the eruptions of the 1960s put considerable pressures on the ways in which universities and the disciplines concerned with history and culture and social life thought about themselves and their ultimate purposes and responsibilities. <clears throat> Meanwhile, early practices at NEH were being influenced by the mostly unwelcome interventions of Congress, led by the relentless senator from Rhode Island, Claiborne Pell. For Pell and like-minded politicians, the expenditure of public funds in the service of the humanities had to have demonstrable public impact and effect beyond the remote and to some indecipherable work of humanity scholars closeted away in universities. Pell therefore pushed for and ultimately realized a system of state humanities councils that created public programs and regranted federal funds to local organizations. The theory and the practice of the so-called public humanities were generated in part by the leaders and work of these state councils, though the cause was also taken up eventually by academic humanists and more recently by the Humanities Center movement, including, of course, the Warren Center. By the late 1970s, NEH was beginning to make significant investments in much more public expressions of its work. The agency established a public program, a division of public programs, and began experimenting with programming in the public arena, primarily in the museum field and in public television. These early efforts were at first halting and uncertain and clearly regarded as less important than the research agenda. But they led to bolder and more confident initiatives in the fields of documentary filmmaking and radio production and support for humanities programs in public and private libraries, historic sites, cultural organizations of all shapes and sizes. The first decade of NEH's work also saw the creation of a program in seminars and institutes for college teachers and high school teachers, which were ultimately expanded, excuse me, to include high school teachers in the 1980s. More recently, NEH has led the way in the evolution of the digital humanities, which have extraordinary significance for public engagement with these disciplines. What began, in other words, as an enterprise devoted to research became an engine for a complex and diverse array of humanities activities and practices around the country. As NEH was making its public turn, a different construction of the humanities was emerging within the academy. I want to call this construction pragmatic in the specific philosophical sense intended by William James and John Dewey and Richard Rorty, among others. In this understanding of the humanities, the concept of experience replaces tradition as the foundation and touchstone of humanities practices. This reorientation toward the realm of experience was also influenced by the phenomenology flowing from France and Germany in the works of people like Martin Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty. In both phenomenology and pragmatism, the lived experience of the world, the lived experience of the world is the anchoring focus and preoccupation. This attention to lived experience and the related understanding of the humanities as a means of illuminating our experience was given additional energy by the view of culture that was emerging from anthropology. The most important proponent of this view in the American context was undoubtedly Clifford Geertz. Geertz's great manifesto, The Interpretation of Cultures, was published in 1973, just as NEH was taking its first halting steps toward a more public engagement with the humanities. In that work, Geertz developed an understanding of culture as a network of symbols that give meaning to every level and dimension of individual and collective experience. The task of the ethnographer, Geertz argued, is to describe or interpret the meaning of culture by way, the way of what he called thick description, 
an interpretive process relying as much on the literary and artistic imagination as on methods of scientific observation and analysis. In this world of symbolic systems and the meanings they generate, culture is comprehensive of every part of life, including the political, the commercial, and the mundane. Culture is everywhere, in other words, and it gives meaning to everything we do. The paradigm bequeathed to us by Aristotle and John Adams is now turned on its head, or as Geertz and William James both suggested in reference to a jocular expression in Hindu cosmology, it's culture all the way down. This pragmatic and ethnographic turn in the humanities led to the erosion of distinctions that were part of the classical paradigm and most notably the distinction between high and low culture, between elite culture and mass culture. As this distinction weakened, vast new tracks of human experience have come under the gaze of humanists hungry to extend the boundaries of their endeavors. Today, the humanities in the United States are broadly arrayed across a vast landscape of cultural material and study. In principle, everything is open to investigation and interpretation. And that investigation is going on in many places outside the academy, in museum and library communities, especially, but also in historic sites and in documentary film and radio. The contemporary humanities are not just concerned with public things, they're being practiced out in public spaces and institutions, informed by and simultaneously informing academic research. I started these remarks with the assertion that in some form or another, the humanities almost always come back to the centrality of meaning in our individual and collective lives. What I want to suggest by way of conclusion is that a broadly public and pragmatic understanding and practice of the humanities is one of the most promising and indeed essential platforms for their future evolution in the United States, both inside and outside the academy. My conviction in this regard has a great deal to do with our and your immediate circumstances. Within the academy, and I would also say within almost every part of our educational system, the humanities and the arts are under significant pressure. Notice I didn't use the word crisis. Just how much pressure and with what effects varies enormously, I'm discovering, from place to place and from institution to institution. But over the past decade at least, there has been a steady and general narrowing of public discussion about the purposes of education at all levels. Most of us would attribute that narrowing to at least three things. The recent economic recession, and related vocational anxieties, which I'm sure you see here, the ascent of the STEM disciplines and the general fascination with technology, and the implementation of testing regimes that have overwhelmed primary, secondary teachers, and secondary teachers and administrators. The implications of this narrowing have rightly generated considerable alarm among those who are inclined toward a more generous understanding of educational purpose. And close to the top of the list of the most worrisome implications is what this narrowing might mean for our civic life. As John Dewey understood, the theory and practice of American democracy have always been closely tied to educational practices that support the elemental requirements of citizenship. Those requirements include a reasonably broad acquaintance with American history, a grasp of the fundamental principles of liberal democracy, and acquaintance with a cultural landscape that we currently inhabit. It's hard to imagine how we sustain a vibrant democratic political culture in this country without a sustained commitment at all levels of education to the forms of humanistic learning that support democratic institutions and practices. While the humanities are critical to the integrity of our democratic institutions, I'm also quite sure they're critical to our collective capacity to address our most difficult and vexing contemporary social challenges. Most of the great issues of the day, think of race relations or immigration, the legacies of recent wars, the vexing questions being raised by genetic engineering, our relationships with the natural world, are not, in the end, technical or scientific in nature. 
though technology and science certainly raise their fair share of thorny issues. Rather, the grand challenges of our times almost always appear at the intersection of our history, our culture, our ideas, and our values. These are the domains in which the humanities have their proper and distinctive place, and these are the domains in which we need much more of the imaginative, moral, and intellectual capacities embedded within the humanities. Last but not least, we need to be concerned that the current narrowing of educational purpose will negatively affect the culture of innovation that has been such a critical element of American life. Since I previously associated him with a traditional and somewhat backward-looking view of the humanities, I want to resurrect Frederick Burkhart by sharing his extraordinarily prescient and interesting comment on the relationship between scientific progress and humanistic learning, also delivered in this same testimony before Congress. He said, there is now a widespread concern that the emphasis on science, important as it is, has produced an imbalance in our civilization and specifically in our educational system where much of the vast amount provided for the support of science and scientific research has been invested. There has been no comparable investment in the humanities and in the arts, and in consequence, the education of our young, including our young scientists especially, runs the risk of becoming narrowly technical and short-sighted, a lopsided, half-starved educational system is something this country simply cannot afford, however strong in technology, however strong in defense and wealth. Science itself will suffer in such an environment. The path to a renewed understanding of education goes by way, I think, of the rediscovery of the fundamental importance of the education of the whole person. We need to reconnect to the educational ideal that has until now distinguished the American educational system, and particularly its system of higher education, the ideal of liberal learning. And we must recapture that commitment in every kind of institution, from the rural high school to the major urban research university, excluding this one, which never lost it. The humanities must be front and center in this reimagining of liberal learning, for it is the humanities that put us back in touch with our experience. Not our experiences rendered by the natural sciences and the highly quantitative social sciences, those, those renderings are surely important, but our experience as it is lived out in the world by actual people. It's the humanities that give us access to and help us comprehend our experience in its raw, unmediated, and ultimately inescapable and irreducible form. Robert Penn Warren certainly understood this. In 1964, he traveled across the country interviewing leaders and participants in the civil rights movement. As I know you're all aware, these interviews were published in book form in 1965 under the title, Who Speaks for the Negro? Warren answered his own question by gathering firsthand accounts of this extraordinary social movement. A decade later, in 1974, Warren delivered the Jefferson Lecture, the highest honor bestowed by the National Endowment for the Humanities. In that lecture, he argued for the central importance of literature and poetry in the life of democracy. I suppose that I do think of poetry as a passion in the soul, he said, though that lingo is highfalutin. <laughs> Even a nourishment of the soul, and indeed of society to boot, in that it keeps alive the sense of self and the sense of community. It even, in the same act and same moment, helps one to grasp reality and to grasp his own life. Not that it will give definitions and certainties, but it can help us to ponder what St. Augustine meant when he said that he was a question to himself.
Thank you very much. I'd, I'd love to take questions or hear comments. Yes. So one place in the world where the humanities are not under pressure, in fact, they're growing, is the People's Republic of China. And this is because the Ministry of Education has determined that the traditional emphasis on rote memorization is stifling yeah. creativity and innovation and so on. So they're actually pouring more resources into the humanities across the spectrum. So I'm wondering if this is information you could share with our leaders in Washington. <laughs> That's a great idea. I hadn't thought about that before. I have heard uh, people talk about that. I'm not a China expert. In fact, I've never been to China. But I have heard people talking about that in the last couple of years um, in different ways, I think, and for maybe some different reasons. Japan has also developed a, a sort of, of, of a pattern, or at least in some institutions, of liberal learning. Um, and Korea, interestingly, I think is moving down this road in an interesting way. Um, there's a culture that has, you know, high-end technical proficiency and training and now is reaching for something else. Um, of course, Japan just recently made another kind of announcement where they're kind of eliminating humanities programs in some of the public universities. You saw that though the private sector there is huge. So I, I do think that's quite interesting. Um, I, I met with um, a minister of culture at NEH uh, last year. We've had a, a kind of a memorandum of understanding with uh, the Ministry of Culture in China for a number of years. And they come and parade through NEH periodically and talk in, to me, completely mystifying ways about what we might do together. But um, it was interesting to me talking to them that um, when they think about the humanities, or at least when this person was talking about the humanities, he mostly talked about the arts. He was mostly talking about the arts. Th this notion of a deep insertion into history and culture didn't seem to register. Yeah. Did, did, didn't <laughs> seem to register. So um, with, with that, with that uh, sort of qualification, I would say, I'd, I'd like to know more about that conversation, and I'd certainly like to start a, a, a contest between the United States and China. <laughs> Yes. I'm wondering when, when is it at institutions such as Vanderbilt with terrific students who are pretty much good at everything, mm. when you have somebody who's interested in the humanities, but you get a little bit worried about the future of that person who could make it in the business world and law or something else, what would you say would be good advice or your advice to, to young people who are deciding on professions that are inclining towards the humanities but not necessarily I'm sure that's going to be the right career. Inclining toward the humanities in the sense of going to graduate school in the right. humanities? Well, I think as a, I mean, I, I, I dealt with this at Colby. I, I, I think, you know, you, you, you describe the, the professional realities, uh, I think, as accurately as you can. I still think there are reasons to go on uh, to graduate school and maybe increasingly as graduate schools change, I'm not sure what's happening here uh, in the humanities and graduate education, but NEH, as you might know, just announced a new program where we're supporting, we're going to make grants to graduate programs in the humanities to broaden the aperture of the way they're thinking about the professional opportunities for their students. I think it's really, I mean, we're just at the beginning of this process. I think it's really interesting to think about the professional opportunities that might arise for humanists outside of the conventional track into the academy, which is clearly narrowing and, and kind of unforgiving right now. It has been in times past, too. I, it certainly was when I got out of graduate school, partly because I had a really weird degree. But um, it's been tough before. You know, it's probably tougher now than it ever was, but it, this is not a completely new thing. So I think there may still be reasons for people to do that, but I think graduate programs and um, institutions have to start thinking differently about that whole question and to find uh, 
w ways to think about life after graduate school uh, with and for students uh, that raise new professional possibilities. I think, my personal view is, that that will change the curriculum in graduate school. And frankly, I think the reason we went into this uh, at NEH was to sort of quietly uh, sort of encourage that curricular change. Uh, because the, the, the disciplinary specialization and sub-specialization that's been characteristic of the graduate programs in the humanities is probably not serving the undergraduate curriculum very well. And it's probably, it's surely not serving the professional prospects of students very well. So I think we have a long way to go in that regard. Um, yeah. Well, I know the president has recently um, spoken out against the over-testing of our nation's children. <coughs> um, could you say more about what might be going on in conversations um, in the government about, I mean, not necessarily backing off of testing, but just other ideas for how to um, get our kids more excited about learning within, within the school system? You know, Arnie Duncan didn't consult with me before, uh, before making that, that was my pronouncement um, and uh, hasn't consulted with me in the past about, about other things. I can surmise or guess that there's so much feedback coming back to them about the pressure on, on administrators and teachers, as I said, that, that it's just the whole thing is kind of breaking and they've got to find some other uh, way of talking and thinking about this. I have a good friend who teaches in the Ann Arbor uh, school system, high school, and a long talk with him last summer about it. And he said it was just, it was just crushing the innovative capacities of teachers and administrators. And it was particularly adverse for the humanities and the arts. So I think there's probably so much feedback coming in that, that they've got to rearrange this. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I was very happy to see that announcement. Um, and I, I hope it might help steer the ship in a different direction uh, because the testing regime has really been brutal, I think, uh, and, and not friendly to the kinds of things we care about. Well, I mean, they yeah. Yeah, you know, I see it as connected too, and um, I, I hope it will lead to some kind of course correction. Now, um, certainly, all of us as adults who deal with kids and school districts and school boards, you know, can can play a role in this too. Um, in in pressing for a reconsideration of that whole regime, which I think has been very problematic. Yes? Public policy uh, in the realm of humanities has often just been advocacy for more investment in the humanities. Uh, all the other academies, the NIH, the uh, National Academies of Science, uh, have strong research programs into public policy in areas like climate change or science and culture, et cetera. Has NEH given any thought to uh, funding and supporting the role of humanists in the formulation of public policy around issues not directly connected with literature, history, or the other parts of the humanities? Yes, and the Chancellor and I were talking about this. Um, I'm involved in a, a, a study, two studies actually, at the National Academy of Sciences. One, <clears throat> very narrowly focused on this uh, breathtaking new biomedical engineering technology, CRISPR, and you know, all the related issues. Uh, I think this is going to be a big national study coming out of the National Academy of Sciences. And there are humanists, some of which we have recommended, engaged in that conversation. My hope is that there won't be just, though there importantly and, and, and necessarily will be ethicists involved in that conversation, but I think there's lots of other uh, human, humanities types that need to be involved, historians of science, uh, people who, who see the long picture of this conversation, uh, beginning with Asilomar and you know, going up through all the years. 
I met a very interesting young historian of science at um, Arizona State who had written some very interesting articles on Asilomar and sort of put them in a critical historical perspective. So that's one thing. The other bigger study, which is probably uh, uh, more consequential in the long run for the humanities, is a, what I think will become a major study of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine on the integration of the humanities, medicine, science, and engineering. Integration. And I think there's a huge amount of work that can be done there and a huge amount of thinking that can be done there to think about what that integration really looks like and what it really means. I, I think, at, at the least, it means that in places like this that could pull this off in some way, that you'd have to think, rethink pretty profoundly the undergraduate curriculum, uh, both in the sciences and, and in, the, in the humanities. Um, and you'd have to kind of lead behind a lot of that disciplinary organization of the curriculum, as we currently understand it, to get into some of these uh, much more integrative kinds of questions. Uh, I can't go a whole lot beyond that because I haven't uh, uh, studied that. The, 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 but, but that's out there waiting to happen, and I think it's very exciting. Um, and with the professional schools, not just medicine, but you know, I mean, you all have these great professional schools here. And, and you know what I mean. Um, so I think those are some of, the, some of the big questions that humanities types can and should be involved in and that are very exciting. And I think they hold the future in some ways to the re-energizing of the humanities in the liberal arts curriculum uh, in colleges and universities. I think that's the frontier. I don't know if there are uh, examples of a kind that would be persuasive to you right now. Um, and the next frontier for me <laughs> is thinking more, more specifically about this and, and working this up more. I, I attended an incredibly interesting uh, lecture uh, by Dan, the political theorist Daniel Allen a couple of weeks ago at Loyola in a, at a festival or a, a conference in honor of NEH's 50th. And she was talking about uh, the reconstruction of a liberal arts paradigm for democracy uh, and for democratic citizenship that sort of tears up the old sheet and brings in a new sheet. Um, and she, too, uh, sort of sees it out there but hasn't uh, deeply defined it. But I, I think that's, that's a for instance of a, of a set of issues or a single issue that I think is incredibly interesting. She observes, and it's of course true, that the, that the, the liberal arts that, that you know here and that I knew at Colby and Stanford and lots of other places is really derivative of a, an elite form of education which was um, designed to educate leaders, right? educate members of an elite. And it did a pretty good job of that, actually. Uh, the, the, the issue, the challenge we have in front of us now is, is what does a more generalized version of liberal learning look like that has that democratic impulse and objective, uh, but that is, is, is not just for elites. I've been spending a lot of time talking to community college people, who, by the way, are very interested in these questions. You know, we don't give them enough credit for, for thinking about liberal learning and thinking about education for democracy in addition to the vocational piece. And, uh, 
that, those are the places in which I think a new image of liberal learning in the sort of in this deeply democratic sense needs to play out. I mean, it has to work in those kinds of, of, of settings. So I see a lot of these problems and I see a lot of these opportunities. I'm, I'm not completely fluent yet in, in the practices that, that need to emerge. I'm getting there. Give me another couple of years. I'll come back and, <laughs> and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Not so sure I could comment on the boardroom. I think there are tremendous opportunities for integrating uh, business education and the humanities. And I didn't mean, by the way, to, to develop a simple-minded opposition between science and the humanities. Um, because I, as I said, I think there are integrative and integrating uh, possibilities there that are very, very significant. And I think science and scientists want and need that integration just as we need it uh, from, from our point of view. But I think going back to the business model, I think there are huge and hugely interesting opportunities for that kind of integration as well. Um, when I was at Bucknell, I tried to make this happen. It was a total failure. Uh, <laughs> but um, there was a, pr a very robust business program there. And I wanted to insert a number of sort of humanities and humanistic social science um, features into that program. I didn't get very far. Um, but obviously, history and business history, financial history, there are so many dimensions of history that, that play into uh, that possible integration. Uh, there are wonderful um, anthropological and sort of cultural and organizational humanities work that would make a huge amount of sense. I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't uh, brand new. Uh, you know, people have been talking about organizational culture and the culture of organizations for a long time. Um, and there are anthropologists and social theorists who work in this space. Uh, but that's another, you know, dimension of this that's hugely important and it would have a lot of uh, really exciting and kind of meaningful um, uh, effects, I think, in integrating the humanities and, and professional business education. And there is, of course, the ethical, the philosophical, the ethical dimension, which is, you know, we just went through this big episode. I think we all remember this episode we went through, where, you know, there were certainly lots of um, ways in which, looking back on that experience, the Great Recession, we, we understand that there were a lot of ethical issues and sort of what was, what was happening or not happening. So those are all you know, very uh, exciting kind of combinatory possibilities. Um, will that get to the boardroom? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I, may, may, maybe someday. Um, I've been on one corporate board. Uh, I, 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 I don't think I influence the, <laughs> the culture of that board from a great deal by, by my humanities background. But educating students in business school in a different way would be a, a great start. You've been wonderfully attentive. I appreciate it. And I'm very proud and honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs>